The Kaya Girl, Chapter 7 The night before the wedding, when I caught Asana staring at the knife, that was the night everything changed, she began. I sat back, feeling the pleasant mix of comfort and suspense that a child would feel on hearing once upon a time. And not only for Asana, for me too, she continued. The two of us had to hurry and decide everything before Auntie Fatima got home. Oh yes, she had gone to borrow the jewelry from her sister, hadn't she? I recalled aloud. Yes, Faiza said, and she could be home any moment. Athena whispered to me, her face coming back to life. I want to be on that bus at dawn. You will, my sister, I promised her. I had no idea how I was going to do it. But I was more sure about that than I had ever been about anything else in my life. I was going to get her on that bus. We whispered together until Auntie came back, humming to herself and displaying her booty of gold and beads. She had drunk some beer at her sister's house in early celebration, so she was jovial and a little drowsy. I had seen Auntie drink beer before, and I knew when she got the chance, it would not just be one bottle. I was jubilant. She would sleep well. I, on the other hand, chewed cola that night. I hated it. It was the bitterest thing I knew, and I never understood why it was so popular. But I knew that it kept people awake, and that was what I needed to be. Asana and I slept on the mat on the floor, on the other side of the raffia screen that gave Auntie some privacy in her bed. Asana did not chew cola, but she lay there and blinking. While I swelled the mash of cola around my mouth, musing that the bitterness alone was enough to keep one awake. Auntie Fatima snored for a couple of hours, but I needed her to stop. I knew her sleeping patterns, and the snoring stage was when she could easily wake up. When she stopped snoring and her mouth hung helplessly open, saliva trickling out of a scanner, that was when she could sleep through a hurricane. At last, I heard the blessed sound of silence. I walked upright to her. I even dared to light a small stamp of candle, which I placed inside a small tin to dim the light. So she was gone all right. The beer scent still hovered above her, and I turned away, no seated, and yet feeling the tug at my heart for her and for what she will face tomorrow. Asana was sitting upright on the mat. It was time. I beckoned her over. I was going to need help. We went over to the table that held Auntie's steaks of pots and pans. Auntie always tied her money inside her wrapper cloth. But her bank, which she only opened once a week, that was somewhere else. Even Asana did not know where that was because her mother was so secretive about it. I lifted the smallest pan from the tallest steak. Its enamel finish was a warm cream oh. color with fluffy petal blue, red and yellow flowers painted on either side of the edge in silver. I handed it over to Asana, who spread her wrapped cloth on the floor and placed the pot gently on the top of it, cushioning any clinking it might make. By the time she turned back to me, I was holding the second pot. She took this and placed it next to its smallest twin and then folded the cloth against the inverted lid of the larger pot, picked up the smaller one and placed it deliberately on top. She repeated this each time I handed her a larger pot, lifting the steak with a greater and greater care as it rose higher and higher. I, for my part, had to be extremely careful not to knock down any of the other surrounding steaks while working at the table. After five pots, Asana needed me not only to help her lift the new steak without it toppling over, but also to lend my own wrapper cloth to continue the wrapping and cushioning process. Against the daily hubbub of the village, Auntie could easily unstick and restick this pot without anyone noticing. But in this still night air, the smallest clink was audible. It might not wake her, but one never knew who else might be awake or wandering around outside. And although we were only communicating with sign language, I knew that in our heads we were both fearing the cacophony. That will arouse the whole village if one false move brought this taste crashing down. We handled Auntie's precious paws like raw eggs, working in a slow motion of soundless, nameless dread.
For much as our every impulse was to rush and flee, we knew that a single careless slip could cost us everything. At last, the tenth pot, a mammoth vessel, was exposed. I lifted a slid into the air and there, wrapped in a half scarf at the bottom, was Antifati's bank. If we were lucky, she would not be visiting it for some days. Still holding the large timber-like lid in my left hand, I wondered how much Asana would need to make it to Accra. Accra, I thought incredulously. Imagine that my very own sister, cousin, might be there the next day. If we pulled this off, I wondered what the huge city was like. The biggest I'd ever seen in my life was Tolong, not even Tamale. I dared not take too much notes for fear of making the theft too noticeable. After all, I was not going anywhere myself and will be there to face the music. The hoot of an owl nearby made us both jump and I nearly dropped the huge lid. I looked at Asana urgently. It was no owl, it was Rakia. She was good at that sound and it was a signal we had agreed upon. I had told them that I would be coming with them because I knew she and the other girls would be too alarmed by the prospect of the bride joining their fugitive group. After all, they were relying on the festivities as a smokescreen for their departure. But once they were on the point of leaving, an argument would create too much of a disturbance, so I was counting on the urgency of the moment for Asana's acceptance. Tremblingly, I set down the huge pot lid and grabbed the word of notes. I peeled off some few, not even seeing their denomination in the dimness or having any idea if what I was taking was far too little or too much. We were simply out of time. I thrust the small roll into Asana's hand, embraced her, and turned towards the door. She turned back to grab the little bag she had prepared from its hiding place, and then pointed anxiously at the pores. I gestured back, don't worry, I'll deal with them, and pushed her through the door. Rekia and the other girls were crouched in the bush outside, signaling their haste. They would not even see that it wasn't me. Asana turned and hugged again for the last time. Then I watched her run over to the others and together, without losing any moment, they ran away. Yes, I cheered. So did they get away? I asked Faiza. Yes indeed, she replied. They made it. At least, I assumed they did because that was the last time I ever saw them. Your cousin? Your sister Asana? You haven't seen her since? I asked. No, Pfizer said, and this time, there was real sorrow in her voice. I've looked, but I haven't found her. You've looked? I echoed. Where? Here, she replied. Here in Accra, in this very Makola market. Oh, so that's why, she nodded. Yes, that's why I came. That's why I'm here. And your auntie let you go? I asked. She nodded. Auntie was never the same after Asana left. Poor thing, I said. What was it like when they found out she was gone? Well, the next morning, we were awoken by the sound of singing. Luckily, I'd fallen into a deep sleep by then. I would not have believed I could sleep a wing on such a night, but on the work of putting all those pot back on my own and the relief that she had got away just knocked me out. So when the singing woman arrived, I woke at the same time as Auntie Faiza, in genuine confusion, which luckily for me, was taken for shock at Asana's absence from the mat next to mine. It took a few seconds to remember everything, and by the time the sweet memory of her flight hit me, I was alert enough to hide it. I jumped out from my mat in alarm, pretending to look for Asana in the corners of the room. The woman had come to fetch the bride, to take her for bathing, and for the rites that needed to be performed on this special morning. Some ran outside to look for her, while Auntie Faiza clenched her stomach and hurried outside too. Her bowels always reacted first to bad news. It was decided that some of the women would walk to the stream to find out if Asana had gone there to bath herself or fetch water. This postponed the evil moment for a bit. 
but a sense of dread was upon everyone. By the time they were back from the stream, shaking their heads, there was more hubbub in the village as the absence of some other girls had also been discovered. People were beginning to suspect what had happened. It was not the first time a band of girls had run away, but no one wanted to be the first to suggest it. Not when a largest bride must be one of the group. Auntie was hysterical, tearing after her clothing like a mad woman and dripping off her headscarf to expose the short grey hair that hardly anyone ever saw. Her sister was sent for and came running to console her. I was asked to prepare some porridge for her, which I gladly did, anxious to avoid questions, but I need not have worried. She was too distraught to do anything but weep and hyperventilate. She and her sister stayed in the room all day while uncle went off to Alaji's compound to face the music. I heard that he prostrated himself before Alaji brown seat, begging for forgiveness. Later that day, we saw a police car enter the village. Uncle ran and hid in the bushes. Two policemen from the station at Tolong went to Alaji's compound. I heard he paid them good money and told them to go and find Pfizer. Uncle did not venture back home till well after dark, but Auntie hardly noticed. I wondered what upset her more, the loss of her daughter or the loss of her new status as mother of the bride and mother-in-law to the most powerful man in the village. Later on, I felt I had done her an injustice though because she never said anything about the missing money. I knew my aunt well enough to know that she would never have overlooked even a single missing note. The fact that she said nothing suggested to me that she must have had her own thoughts about how they had gone missing. And perhaps she was not inclined to make a fuss about the loss of money that might have given her daughter a safe passage to wherever she had fled. I wondered if she puzzled over exactly who had taken it. But if she suspected me, she would have showed it after all, she knew how close Asana and I were, and if that money had been used for Asana, then it did not really make any difference who had done the taking. Sometimes, I even thought that there must be a part of her that was secretly relieved that her daughter had been spared a marriage she had dreaded so much. Two years passed, and we thought we might see some of the missing girls back from the granite harvest. And if not see them in our village, then, at least, hear that they had been to nearby villages. But this never happened. I suspected that, with the inclusion of Asada in the group, they judged it too risky to return after a few couple of years. No one wanted to face the wrath of a large brown seed, despite the fact that he had chosen a replacement bride within a month, frustrated by the incompetence of the district police. The girl had already produced a child, and whenever I saw her, I gave silent thanks to Allah on behalf of Asana, but at the same time, implored him to keep her safe wherever she was. And that was something I wondered about every day. One day, a little girl arrived in our household. She was about seven years old, and a daughter of one of auntie's other brothers. That made her my cousin but I had never met her before. She was older than I had been when I was giving to auntie. She cried a lot at the beginning because she missed her home, but I tried to comfort her and joke with her, and after a couple of months, she was well settled and had learned a lot from me about the household chores she had to do. I waited for another month and then asked auntie if I could go and look for Asana. Where will you look for her? Where will you look? She asked me. In the big city market, I said. You know all the girls who run away go there. Faiza, do you know where my daughter is? Auntie asked me, looking into my eyes. It was the first time she had asked me about it directly. I was relieved to be able to answer truthfully. No, Auntie Fatima, I do not. She dropped her eyes and I continued. I miss her too, auntie. Please, let me go and look for her. I can do it. Rakia had told me that they would see how far their money took them. 
They were hoping to get as far as Accra, but they could not be sure, and I had no idea if they had been able to do it. Let me go to Accra, auntie, I begged. She was motionless for a while, as if she had not heard me, and then she nodded heavily. You are growing too now, Faiza, she said. You can also work and earn some money while you are there. You may go. She even gave me money for the lorry fare to Accra. And here you are, I said, looking at Faiza with new comprehension. Yes, here I am, but I have not been successful in my mission. Not yet, I said, but don't give up. Well, I'm not trying to, she said, but I really don't think she's here. You know, Abna, how can you be sure? I asked her. Makola is a huge market, one of the biggest in Africa. I know, she said, but we have our own networks here. I have met other girls I know here, other girls from my village, and they haven't seen or heard anything of her. Even some of the food sellers we have been going to, they are my hey. people too, but they have not heard of any girl like her working in Mokola. So what are you going to do? I asked. Well, she looked directly at me. I'm almost ready to move on, Abna. She said quietly, What? I asked in dismay, You are leaving? I was devastated. I had been so caught up in this little world of our friendship that I had not really thought about the fact that it must come to an end. And not just because Pfizer might be leaving, but because my summer vacation was almost over. Where will you go? I asked her. To Kumasi, she said. Kijitia Market. That one is even bigger than Mokala, I have heard. Yes, I've heard that too, I said. Most of our girls come either to Mokala or Kijitia. So if she's not in Mokala, then that is the next place I must look. And what if she's not there either, I asked. I mean, she might have moved on, got some other work, even got married. Well, I can only try. That is what I promised auntie said Pfizer. So if you don't succeed, will you come back here? I asked anxiously. I also promised auntie I will come back home if I didn't find her, she said, looking down. So that is what I must do. I looked down too. Then I continued, Pfizer, aren't you scared of moving from one big city to the next like that? Do you know anyone or have any place to stay over there? No, she shook her head. But I was scared here in the beginning too, and it all worked out. This friend of mine, I thought yet again, so small but so strong. Abna, I want to thank you, she said, turning towards me. We were sitting on our usual spot outside the shop. Do you remember the day when we first met? I nodded. Well, from the first day you smiled at me and helped me lift my bow. I felt at home in this great, big, scary Makola market. Me too, I said, impulsively. It's strange, but that was the moment I really started feeling at home here. Auntie was here, and Gifty was here, but still, I felt lonely until I met you, Faiza. We hugged each other to say thank you and other things that were harder to express, like how much a Kayayo from the north and the doctor's daughter from the south had come to mean to each other in the space of two months. You know, she said, as we pulled back, I would probably have left already if it wasn't for you. Really? I said. Yes, she replied. Remember when Asana told me I was like a twin sister come back? I nodded. Well, you can never replace a dear person in your life, she continued. But the pain of losing them can diminish when other dear ones come into your life. And in the same way, you helped me get over the pain of losing Asana. I didn't know what to say to that, but I felt honored. I know your school vacation is almost over, Abna, she continued. That is why I'm also getting ready to leave. Will I ever see you again? I asked. I felt a sort of helplessness. My school friends and I met on internet chats and exchange phone calls and text messages 
even after we have spent a whole day at school together and will spend the whole day of the next day together. But here I was, faced with a friend who could not use any of those things, did not own any of those things, and could not even write me a letter with pen and paper or have a P.O. box which I could send her one. How could we live in such different worlds inside the same country? I wondered. I had tried to teach Faiza some reading and writing, and she had done well, but we had not had much time and were still at the early stages. It would take many more lessons for her to be able to write a letter. Although she had been very interested in learning to read and write, she had always been fascinated to learn more about the world around her. And we had spent time talking about things I had learned in history and geography and science lessons, as well as things I had learned through the television and films, especially the cable channels. I never thought of myself as a teacher and had never considered those subjects to be so interesting. They were just part of school, very old school. But now, I realize how disconnected and how shout out one could be from so much of the world without that knowledge. It's not yet time to say goodbye. Pfizer interrupted my thoughts, not quite answering my question, but it was time to let you know. At that moment, Auntie came out of the shop. I should have known you will be here chatting with your friend, she said. To my surprise, she looked at Pfizer with something almost approaching warmth and said, Your friend is soon going back to school, Pfizer. I'm sure you will miss her. Pfizer nodded silently. But just because she is not here doesn't mean you can't continue carrying for my customers, okay? And she actually smiled at her. I couldn't believe my eyes on my ears. She turned to me. I'm going to buy something, so go back and help Gifty in the shop, she said. Yes, auntie, I said, beaming and going into the shop while Pfizer melted into her surroundings. Where have you been? Asked Gifty when I got inside. I said nothing. Oh, outside with your Kayayo, of course. She quipped. Silly question. Well, it's my turn to break now that you're back. She said, you deal with the customers for a change. And she walked out of the shop without saying where she was going, holding the door open as the next customer walked in.